So Mario, as most of you will know, is um, an expert in severe asthma, a member of the Severe Asthma Research Program, professor of medicine and head of various divisions, including pediatrics and allergy and asthma and respirology and critical care at his home university, Washington University in St. Louis. And Mario has been a signally important member of the investigating team. Uh, he's the lead author on the manuscript arising from the Air 2 trial and has been, um, at the very least, a very steady hand at the helm uh, of a very major effort that's gone on now for a number of years. Mario. Thank you, Dr. Cox, and thank you for uh, coming this evening. In this next segment, we'll be covering uh, more detail the results of the AIR-2 trial, uh, which really were the uh, key trial to lead to the approval of this device. So in addition, we'll be also talking about uh, patient selection, what kind of patients are appropriate for bronchial thermoplasty, um, and we'll also end with a review of one of our cases in, in St. Louis. As Dr. Cox alluded to, this is the growing evidence now of over uh, 300 patients. Um, these are the original patients that participate in the clinical trials today uh, that have received bronchial thermoplasty. Now, the pivotal trial that we're going to discuss today, the AIR-2 trial, uh, was really the one that led to the support for its use in severe asthma. The study population we, we picked was really the, the population that you all struggle and I struggle in the clinic with is we've used the best kind of standard of care, you know, the gold kind of standard of care for severe asthma, which is high dose inhaled steroids. Um, and these patients, high dose inhaled steroids plus a long acting beta agonist, and these patients are still symptomatic. Um, in this trial, uh, we chose a patient centered um, primary outcome, the asthma quality of life, uh, which is a validated, validated uh, questionnaire. Uh, that's used to track quality of life in clinical trials. Now this trial was unique for our, our colleagues in pulmonary in that it had a sham control trial. Uh, this is the largest trial uh, that I could find ever published in the respiratory literature uh, that used uh, a sham uh, bronchoscopy. In the study, for every two patients that received active bronchial thermoplasty, there was one patient that underwent um, a sham bronchoscopy and we took great care and detail, attention to detail um, that the sham bronchoscopy looked and sounded like uh, just like the other case. And in fact, there was a radio frequency controller device like Dr. Cox showed earlier in the bronchoscopy suite. It was activated, turned on the bells and the whistles. The only, and a catheter was introduced into the bronchoscope to the same segments as you would with inactive treatment. The only difference was an the energy, the radio frequency energy, was not delivered across uh, the catheter, even though the, the basket was expanded and the button was pressed. And so everything was kept in that regard. And the second part of that, in terms of the sham bronchoscopy, is we had separate teams. There was a treatment team, the bronchoscopist that was doing the active treatment, um, of course, could see if there was blanching of the mucosa when the energy was delivered. Um, but there was a, a separate team that uh, conducted all the assessments, so collected all the clinical data from the patients, and that separate team did not, um, was not participating in any of the treatment sessions itself. Um, this trial was conducted across 30 centers across six uh, countries, uh, enrolled uh, 297 subjects, and the primary endpoint was focused on the one-year follow-up uh, looking at asthma uh, quality of life uh, with gathering information over that time period. This study is still ongoing. In fact, we just completed a few weeks ago four-year follow-up uh, in our patients uh, that participate in that trial. And the plan is to follow these patients for five years post-bronchial thermoplasty so, again, we can capture as much safety information as possible. This next slide summarizes the, the key results in terms of efficacy in regards to the AIR-2 trial and that we improved asthma quality of life uh, in these patients, uh, four out of five patients demonstrated a meaningfully improvement uh, in their asthma quality of life uh, compared to approximately 63% uh, in the control group or the sham bronchoscopy group. There is a 32% reduction in severe exacerbations post-procedure. These are severe exacerbations uh, that are meaningful for your patients because these are ones that your patients have to take oral corticosteroids on. There is an 84% reduction in emergency room visits, a 73% reduction in hospitalizations, 
and a 66% reduction in days lost from work and school uh, and other activities, which translates to about two and a half to three days, extra days uh, of less uh, lost work or school. There were no uh, anticipated, unanticipated uh, device-related uh, adverse events, um, and we'll discuss in more detail for you all um, uh, the results of the adverse events. Now, as demonstrated here is uh, uh, the uh, num a number of the secondary endpoints that we captured uh, regarding healthcare utilization. Um, these are all uh, rates demonstrated here, demonstrating again a 32% reduction in severe yeah. exacerbations requiring steroids, a 22% um, uh, uh, reduction in unscheduled physician office visits, 84% reduction in emergency room visits, and a 73% reduction in uh, hospitalizations. And as noted here, the ones that were statistically significant were severe exacerbations in emergency room visits. Uh, we did not uh, conduct statistics uh, in, the, uh, in comparing the hospitalizations because there was a uh, significant outlier in this uh, uh, sham bronchoscopy group that had eight hospitalizations. Um, therefore, we felt that it was not acceptable to conduct a statistical test uh, for that uh, endpoint. Now, uh, as Dr. Cox alluded to, we are now um, able to present some additional data to you in regards to long-term effects of bronchial thermoplasty. Um, and this was uh, recently uh, published in the Annals of uh, uh, Allergy and Asthma, um, demonstrating what happened to the patients that received the bronchial thermoplasty after one year. And these are results out now to two years. Um, because of the trial and how it was set up, the sham bronchoscopy patients uh, were unblinded after one year. We did not feel ethically that we could keep those patients in the entire ER2 study for five years and, and try to keep the, uh, the study blinded. Um, so at that point, we unblinded the uh, patients that received the uh, uh, sham bronchoscopy, and we continued to follow the patients that received the active treatment. And what's demonstrated here is the uh, rate uh, of uh, uh, severe exacerbations, and if you just focused on uh, this line here, you can see in the first year uh, following bronchial thermoplasty, uh, approximately 30% uh, of those patients uh, received, uh, experienced a severe exacerbation requiring corticosteroids. And then two years out, 23% uh, of those patients reported that. Uh, historically, this was 53% in the year prior to them receiving the bronchial thermoplasty. And again, you can see similar results for emergency room visits and hospitalizations that even now two years out from the treatment, that this benefit in terms of healthcare utilization uh, is sustained. Importantly, uh, is, is really considering as a treating physician is, is to talk about safety. And, and as uh, we mentioned, there are a number of, of patients that have participated in these trials and uh, share that data with you all so that you can discuss this with your patient um, uh, in detail. And as part of this, uh, um, we have now um, close to 600 patients that have uh, received bronchial uh, thermoplasty. And you'll note here that there have been no uh, device-related uh, deaths or major adverse events, um, that there have been um, definitely an increase in respiratory adverse events that occurred in those patients that received the active bronchial thermoplasty. This typically is an increase in their asthma symptoms. Will they report an increase in their shortness of breath, uh, chest tightness, or wheezing? Uh, this occurs typically within 24 hours, resolves with the treatment that we use in these patients, which is uh, nebulized bronchodilators uh, and systemic corticosteroids. Um, and these typically resolve within seven days. And then we'll talk in more detail about uh, serious adverse events uh, that occurred uh, in the ER2 trial. And this demonstrated here in terms of the number of hospitalizations that occurred post-procedure uh, you can see that there were 10% in those that received bronchial thermoplasty compared to 2% uh, in the sham bronchoscopy group. And that same rate is depicted here uh, per bronchoscopy. Um, so overall, there's about a 3% risk per bronchoscopy of hospitalization in patients that received bronchial thermoplasty and definitely increased in compared to the sham bronchoscopy uh, group that did not receive the uh, thermal energy. Now, if one looks at those hospitalizations a little bit more detailed to figure out, you know, what are these hospitalizations that occur with bronchial thermoplasty? That's depicted here. The 19 hospitalizations that occurred in 16 subjects um, in the bronchial thermoplasty. Again, these were 190 subjects that received 
uh, bronchothermoplasty, which is twice uh, the number here in the sham bronchoscopy group. Um, and there were two hospitalizations in that group and two subjects. You'll note that the majority of these events, 12 of these hospitalizations were asthma was aggravated and then a series of, uh, of other events uh, less frequently, including uh, anaplexis and then uh, some unfortunate event of somebody aspirating a prosthetic tooth. Now, um, this safety data has continued to be carefully uh, uh, followed over time. Um, there have been no deaths reported with uh, bronchial thermoplasty. Uh, there's been an absence of any clinical complications. Um, as Dr. Cox uh, demonstrated stability of pulmonary function tests, as well as um, uh, presented at the American Thoracic Society meeting um, um, in 2010, I believe. Um, the CT scans at one year, again demonstrating that there were no structural changes uh, post-bronchial thermoplasty in those patients that received that in comparison to the sham uh, bronchoscopy group. So importantly, there was no evidence of bronchiectasis or any strictures or any collapse uh, of any of the lobar segments. So this next section, I'd like to focus on what are the appropriate patients for you to consider uh, this uh, new and novel treatment for. This is the FDA approved uh, indication for bronchial thermoplasty using the Allaire system. It's approved only in adults 18 years and, and older whose asthma is not well controlled with inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta agonists. And again, you may want to consider who is the appropriate patient for you um, in terms of um, uh, treating with bronchial thermoplasty. Certainly those patients that have received frequent oral corticosteroid bursts that are related to exacerbations, or perhaps those patients that are already on, on high dose of inhaled steroids and long-acting beta agonists, perhaps have tried Zolaire or omalizumab, have not achieved a response, or perhaps do not fit the criteria uh, for the use of omalizumab. Um, and then lastly is uh, making sure that that patient you're comfortable with as a bronchoscopist in, in terms of proceeding with uh, uh, the procedure. Um, these are the contraindications for bronchial thermoplasty. Um, and the first uh, are really related to uh, the use of uh, electronic devices, any sensitivity to medications that we use commonly in bronchoscopy. Um, and prior treatment with uh, the Allaire system or bronchial thermoplasty because we have no experience in retreating uh, any patient. Uh, we do uh, want to caution in these uh, particular scenarios, uh, patients that have active respiratory tract infections, probably not the most prudent to go ahead with uh, the thermoplasty and delay it for, and we usually delay it for a period of about four weeks. Um, if there's been any change in the corticosteroid dose uh, in the last uh, two weeks, a known bleeding disorder if they're taking any type of uh, anticoagulant, uh, antiplatelet regimen. Um, and you have to kind of use your own guidance in how you do other bronchoscopies in terms of the period of time after stopping uh, those agents uh, if they can be. So I just want to end with uh, a patient uh, that we treated now a little bit over four years ago. Um, she is a young patient um, who had become pretty disabled from her asthma um, after being quite active in college, uh, in collegiate sports, um, she now was uh, taking high doses of inhaled steroids and long-acting beta agonist, advert 500. Um, she was using her beta agonist two to three times a day and only had about 18% of her days that were symptom-free. Um, she had a recent uh, emergency room visit uh, that she had uh, uh, in the in the few months prior to seeing us uh, and required uh, systemic corticosteroids for that. Uh, but in addition, she had two unscheduled uh, uh, office visits um, due to her exacerbations of her asthma and had uh, impaired quality of life and had missed five days of work. And this is a quite productive uh, young woman. Um, now, in terms of her examination, she had clear breath sounds, uh, preserved lung function with an FE1 of 108% uh, of predicted. And she underwent uh, bronchial thermoplasty with a typical uh, procedure. Um, with about uh, two to three weeks apart from each uh, procedure. We prophylact her uh, with uh, oral prednisone uh, for three days prior um, at 50 milligrams per day, the day of and the day after. And we use typical um, conscious sedation uh, in her case. Uh, approximately 60 activations were done in each of those um, um, areas that we treated at each um, time point. Uh, we monitor postoperatively. Again, one of the things that is a little bit different here from other bronchoscopies is um, we do want to ensure that their lung function is stable post-procedure. 
And so an FEV1 is measured prior to the bronchoscopy in, in her particular case, uh, and then uh, post uh, bronchoscopy, you want to make sure that they achieve within 80% of pre procedure FEV1. We contacted her subsequently to the treatment to make sure she was doing well. And we also uh, did an office visit where we reassessed her lung function and then decided whether or not to proceed to the second and to the third uh, treatments. Now, short term, she reported uh, no um, uh, pain associated with this. She did report increased coughing and, and wheezing that's typical for her asthma. Uh, and these occurred after each of her procedures. Uh, she would increase her beta agonist use uh, with these for about one to two days. Um, and uh, now, long term, um, she has had no asthma exacerbations requiring steroids. She has had no further visits to the emergency room and she um, uses her beta agonist much uh, less frequently. As noted here at the bottom, she's really one of our star patients in that uh, she's now able to return back to her previous level uh, in terms of her collegiate sports um, and does now run uh, two half marathons. Um, though recently, she uh, and her husband uh, are, uh, are now expecting twins in about uh, two months. And so we're quite happy uh, post-bronchial thermoplasty uh, things have uh, gone quite well for her. So in selecting those patients that you want to think about um, bronchial thermoplasty now that it's FDA approved, um, we typically will go through our database um, and look at patients in, in our referral uh, population that have severe asthma. Um, we typically will evaluate them with CT scans to make sure that there are no structural issues uh, prior to proceeding with the, the procedure. And we use a, a very similar protocol to what we used in the AIR-2 study. Um, we do uh, follow up our patients by uh, a phone call uh, as well as an office visit. And again, that office visit helps you plan the next procedure. So you have them in the clinic, you've checked their spirometry, and you, you've decided to, to go ahead and proceed, or you've decided to perhaps give them a little bit longer period of time between one of the procedures if they're not doing so well. Um, and then, of course, then referring uh, these patients back to the primary care physician. And um, I, I think that's uh, key in terms of establishing that good relationship uh, with your referring physicians. And additional information can be obtained here um, in terms of uh, bronchial thermoplasty in areas and physicians and centers that are currently doing that.